interpreting to plan? What, what do they say about first plans? Huh. Never survive first contact with enemies. Okay. I suspect that that's not the plan I was thinking of, but that's okay. That still works. Do things ever get made the way the plan says? Or do things ever happen the way the plan spelled out? What causes them not to? Everyone's smirking, so I'm assuming that they never work. So what causes plan the first, the first go at something? What causes it not to work? Impatience. Reality. <laughs> Impatience. I didn't know all the facts. You didn't know all the information that was needed. Inability to follow directions or read the plan. Huh. I would say that's, that's very true. You can eat anything you want. Just don't eat off of this one. Get in a hurry, okay. People, people can make a mess of plans for a variety of reasons. Ego is certainly one of them, probably a very significant contributing factor. What else, what else causes plans not to go the way that they're supposed to go? Yeah. There's unknown realities that upon going into production or going into battle or whatever the case would be, it's like we weren't, that was an unknown, complete unknown. It's very true. It started raining when you're trying to put a roof on that. Yeah, that would be a bad day. Yeah, that, that came up that you just don't follow the plan. You don't follow instructions or variety of, of different ways that that spells out, I believe. But ultimately, it's like, you know, we, we had a plan. And things are not going according to plan. Oh, yeah, because we didn't, we didn't do the plan. That's sometimes how it does go down. I think it all works pretty well the same. Yeah, scheduling is, is more of a timing, but plans have schedules too, right? Virtually every plan has a timeline to it. And yeah, it may have phases even of by this point, we need to have blah, blah, blah done in order for this to work. And if we're honest with ourselves, it probably only happens rarely, that the phase comes to pass even the way it's supposed to. I mean, a sub-plan doesn't even go according to plan, so how could the plan go according to plan, right? How often do we adjust to the changes or adaptations of said plans well? It depends, okay, what does it depend on? Circumstances, okay. Our happiness is circumstantial? If we like the change or not, that's very true. What'd you say? <laughs> yeah, your ability to, to accept things can make a big difference. It's true. What else does it depend on? Whose plan is this? That can be scary to start thinking about. Whose plan is this? And who's, who's making the changes to whose plan is this? I, I don't tend to disagree with you. However, there are many in this world that would definitely contend that that's not the case. 
which is a source of struggle for, I believe, almost all plans anyway. Yeah. Changes, adaptations, they, they have to happen for plans to proceed forward, yes? Even if they're not the original plan, something has to happen in order for life to continue on. Or it doesn't. I mean, I guess, I guess you could have a plan of, well, if this doesn't work, then, then I'm done. You may consider what done actually means, especially when we start considering God's plan. But breakdowns, unexpected things happen. Thing, loads and loads of stuff happens in life, right? And as we live with God, we're going to need to recognize that our surrender is needed. And it, that surrendering helps the rest of God's plan go much better for us. It's a huge slice of humble pie that is best eaten warm and early. Just eat it and live with it because it's, it's probably not good cold. You know, we've had those vegetables that have sat at the table for two hours. And we're, we still have to eat them. And they're not good. They're not good. So there are going to be times when we have to, have to, to, to take on changes, adaptations, uh, life situations that are different than what we thought of, different than what we want. Shoot, they may even be different than what we thought we heard from God himself. And yet, God continues to breathe life into our lives and invite us to follow him well. Let's look at Psalm 139 today. We're going to read one of the psalms that had like, you know, several hundred verses to it seemingly. We decided not to do that. We're just reading Psalm 139. That's right. We're underachievers. Psalm 139, we're going to pick up at verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you and the night will shine like the day. For darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. And when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. If you were, if you had to rate yourself, if you had to rate how well you are functioning right now, where would you be at? One being, I don't function worth a darn. I'm like a broken phone that needs thrown away. Ten, I'm, I'm really rocking awesome. Where would you be at? Think about that for a minute. I gotta grab something. Where would you be at? <laughs> I want Rick to go first. I want him to set the bar of what this discussion is going to be, and then we'll all gauge in from there. I like that. As funny as it is, though, we do that a lot, don't we? I want to hear what someone else says, and then I'll, I'll base my assessment off what, how I compare to them. You'll throw up a three? Okay. Yeah. It's frustrating sometimes, isn't it? To begin looking at valuing ourselves. And depending on it, it's a very, very seldom deal that we accurately can assess how we're doing. Now, we get asked the question all the time, yes? How you doing? Some people even use it as a greeting. Instead of saying hello, out of their mouth comes, how are you doing? And before you can answer, they're gone. We hate doing this, and yet we do it all the time. It's strange. How do you suppose your number compares to how God would say your current reality is? Do you think you're beyond what God says? You under what God says? What do you think? When's the last time you even wrestled with this? Yeah. It's strange when we think of our physical capacity. Think of what you can physically do, whether it be mental, that type of capacity, or physical strength, or any number of things. When was your prime? When could you do it your absolute best? Well, and that's fair. My, my physical trend is doing this. I th I, that's how I feel my physical trend is doing. And my mental trend is doing this. So that whole work smarter, not harder thing definitely comes in more play for me. Because I'm like, I don't, I don't want to work that hard anymore. Because that hurts. And my mind is now saying, if we do it this way, this gets the same job done, and we don't have to work as hard to do it. God has made us, though, and how he made us is not a mistake. This whole passage, this whole passage goes into so much of David revealing how he now understands God has made him. 
Have you ever wanted to get away from God? Have you ever wanted to just call a time out? I need two weeks. Just give me two weeks vacation. David describes it as going, making his bed in the depths. What does that even look like? What would your equivalent to that be? If, I could, if you could make your bed in the depths. Trip to Vegas. Trip to Vegas, okay. <laughs> That's fair. Like you're the worst Go to the worst place you could absolutely think of. He is still there. He is still there. Yeah. God is in the Golden Corral. He's there. That was mean. I'm sorry. Yeah. There's nowhere. There's nowhere that we could go or intentionally or accidentally end up that we escape God's presence. Now that should bring us hope. It may bring you some anxiety because you may want to be escaping him. And when you want to escape God and you can't, that can be tough. If you're there, we will pray for you and help you through however we can. Because that, that is no place to stay. We understand you may be there, but that is no place you ever want to stay. Because it, it's, it's impossible to escape God. When we look at this passage, I want to write some things on the board here. When we look at this passage, what are some things that we see that God knows about us that David proclaims through this passage? Okay. Fearfully and wonderfully made. That's kind of scary, huh? What does that mean? I mean, we say it a lot. We've read it a lot, maybe. We've, we've wrestled with the phrase a little bit. But what does when I sit and when I rise even mean? Okay. So when you sleep and when you wake up? Yeah. Yeah. Every move. You know, the fact that God knows our intentions may concern me even more than he knows our thoughts. But he does, doesn't he? What else? What else can we see from this passage? Anything else? I'm not looking for right answers, just in case you're wondering, like, what else is he looking for? I don't, I don't have right answers that I'm looking for. What else do you see? Anything? It's a pretty good list. Fearfully and wonderfully made, he knows our thoughts, he knows the length of our days, he knows when we sit, when we rise, he knows our every move, he knows our intentions. He knows us. Now, who do you suppose knows us better? Us or God? Okay. 
Now, so if we, if we, do, do we agree with that? God knows us better? When you know something better than someone else, and, and maybe I'm not trying to, I'm not advocating for you to be boastful, but there are things in your life, right, that you know better than other people. You can be an authority and instruct someone on any number of things, right? I'll be honest, Rick. If I'm having a heart attack, I want Teresa to work on me, not you. <laughs> And yet, have you ever encountered someone that when you are, in fact, an authority figure, you're, you're the one that knows more of how a situation or a circumstance needs to be taken care of, someone argues with you about it. Or ask any nurse about a doctor, right? Do these, things, do, they, do these things happen outside the medical field? Yes. Oh, yes. Kids. Kids. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I'm sorry, Don. I can hear, hang on one second. I, 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 I must have heard you wrong. There's no way I heard that correctly. I said sometime family thinks they know better for you than what you know for yourself. I don't get it. I thought that was only my family. I thought that, that no. my family was weird. You, that happens in your family too? Okay, well, that's true. My family is weird. I love them, and they love me. But we do this all the time, don't we? Do you do this with God? Like, we just, we, do, we all pretty much agreed that God knows us better than we do. We list out all the things that he knows about us, and yet we argue with him about our lives. Do you suppose he knows we're frustrated when we're frustrated? Do you suppose he knows we're sad when we're sad? I would even say that he knows the circumstances that are coming, because he does, and what our response will be. And it, it may be as though he's trying to prepare us for what's to come. But it comes back to the same things that we talked about on the very early side of our conversation today. Are we listening? Are we doing what the plan, per se, requires? How are we doing with the changes and the adaptations that are going on? Yeah. Because he really does. If we let him run the show, he suddenly will show us little bits of like, hey, man, I'm glad I was paying attention there. How many of you like driving in fog? Anyone? No one likes driving in fog? Why not? Well, that might be kind of cool, but what, what, why don't you like driving in fog? You can't see nothing. You can't see what's you, ahead. You, can't, you can see what's ahead, but you cannot see as much as you're used to seeing ahead, right? right. This happens in our lives, too, doesn't it? We want to see six years down the road, God. And sometimes we're lucky to see six seconds down the line. Other times you may have six minutes. Six weeks? Six months? And it does. We drove home in fog last night. And there were moments where I'm like, I have to slow down. I have to slow down. I don't have much of a choice because at this point in time, I won't have enough reaction time from the time I can see it to be able to get stopped if I have to. And there were. There were several times that there were people who were driving significantly slower than us, like 20 miles an hour on a highway, which to me seems incredibly dangerous. 
and one vehicle had just one taillight. And it was so hard, we had, to, we had to make a stop off, and so we ended up having to pass them twice in the fog. And so it was like, all of a sudden, it's like, there he is. And it is, it's almost a bit freaky trying to drive in the fog. And yet there are times in our lives when, and I believe that's kind of what David's dealing with here. It's a moment that he recognizes, God, I, I love you. I know that you've made me. I know, I know all these things. And yet I'm dealing with the life that I've got right now. And it doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah. 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 I just couldn't handle it. Were you a passenger at that time? Yes. Yeah. Isn't that really crazy? When you have to be a passenger? Because then you feel even more out of control. I can't see anything. And even if I do see something, I can't do anything about it. Do you ever feel that way in your life? Isn't that kind of crazy? Well, I think that's the, what David is seeing here, because if you, if you go down through here, there it says, where can I go, I take, I ascend, I make, I take, all of this, I say. Yeah. Uh, and in the midst of all of this, because it's, that's, that's what, how we do I, I, I. But he says that surely darkness will overwhelm me. The darkness that God. That's right. And it doesn't obscure God's vision of keeping an eye on us and being able to get it, see us through. And who are we confident in? Who are we confident in? I mean, okay, you were having trouble with your fog, but the kids in the car were confident that you could be God. They were asleep. <laughs> That's true, but yes. They were right. But that yes, they were resting in the fact, even in the midst of this situation, they, they had no reason to be concerned. Partially because they had no idea. And isn't that the truth of our lives, though? We can be, we're told, we're invited to rest, to abide with our God. Even when things seem crazy. Maybe even we should throw in there, especially when things seem crazy and out of control. Now we're, we're in the midst of this. And it's difficult. It's difficult to rest when all you feel is angst. Right? Look right, at the, right there at the end of this psalm, 139. Search me, O God. Search me, O God. And know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Are you willing to do that? Are you, would you write this right now? Search me, O oh God. Would, would you pray this? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. You know what I hate about this verse? I know it's right. How can you hate scripture? <laughs> I don't hate scripture, but there are some parts about this that I don't like. Not because of the scripture itself, but because of what it takes from me. I have to admit that I have anxious thoughts. I have to lay bare, because as though he doesn't know already, I have to lay before God the things on my heart. 
Now, those of us who have been parents or do parenting type stuff in life, we often know things about our children, possibly even before they do. Yes? Would you agree with that? Maybe, maybe not. There are times that our children are wrestling with something, and we know that they're wrestling with something, and we possibly may even know what they're wrestling with and how to help them through it. But until they're ready to start walking through it, you can't help them. And that's frustrating as parents, isn't it? The same is true for all people, I believe. Until we're ready to receive the help we require, people may try to help us, but it will only bring frustration. It will not bring help. What's the purpose of a search? What is the purpose of a search? What, let's rephrase that for a second. What do you ever search for? Something that's lost, okay? Information. Information. Okay, something, something deeper or beyond in a relationship. If you set out to search for something, what do you, what, where do you look? Yeah. What are, what are the limits? I have... They enter your house with a search warrant. Are there limits? Indeed there are. I don't know all the limits that there are with it, but... I think they can look anywhere they want to look. Within my property. So, but see, here again, you... <laughs> David is inviting God yeah. to come into my life and search me. Yeah. And open up this door, open up that door. Yep. Oh, I'm willing to allow God to see some things I may not have really wanted him to see. It's very true. Well, he, yeah, he already knows. And that's that's where we that's where we enter into the the welcoming of surrender. surrender if we're willing to submit to god then this may not be so difficult but when we are trying to, when we're fighting god when we're fighting the plan when we're interrupting what he's wanting to do it it doesn't mean that he loves us any less my children will do things that are they, they do they drive me crazy sometimes but i never stop loving them But there will be times that they try to hide something, and of course a parent knows when a kid's trying to hide something. It's like, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> Where's it at? Yeah. Sure. And that's really frustrating, isn't it? And I, how many of you know the? You've driven from State Route 30 near Upper Sandusky, you're going past the rest area there on the, on the highway, heading west, and you're getting ready to get on 23, that interchange. You know the interchange I'm talking about? We've driven that probably hundreds of times. I mean, I've literally driven that a lot in my life. But because of the fog last night, it was so thick that even knowing the road, I knew the road that I was on, I was familiar with it, and I'm like, this drive would really stink if I had to find signs to know where I had to go. To not know which lane I needed or any of that stuff would be incredibly difficult. And it was amazing. It was amazing because I knew where I was at, sort of, but it was so thick that there were times that I'm like, I know there's a curve here somewhere. I know the lanes merge here somewhere. So I knew the, quote, plan. I knew the route. I knew what needed to be done. And yet, because of the circumstance, it was hard to navigate. And it's true of our lives. We may know what the plan is. We may trust that God has the right plan for us, and we're doing our best to go through with it. We may know this, but it doesn't make it less hard. Do we have the confidence, though, to believe that God will bring us through? Do we have the confidence to rest, to abide with him in order to get through it? 
You know what's frustrating about this whole thing of abiding and whatnot? If you go back to the vine where that whole thing's at, abide in me and you'll bear much fruit, right? It stinks, though, when God starts pruning branches that we think are the fruit that we want to be producing. And it's very, very frustrating on the front side. But God's bringing about the changes. He's bringing about the adaptations. He's bringing about the things that require, are required in order for the plan to proceed forward. David. <laughs> How old was David when he was anointed king? Do you remember? I'm hoping someone knows, because I didn't look this up. This is a sidebar, but he was young, right? Did it make sense for David to be anointed the king at the time? Not from a worldly standpoint, not from a human standpoint. And God even told him that. It's like, I'm not interested in that. I'm not after worldly standards. So David gets anointed, and it, it, he becomes king right away, right? That's how it works? No, that's not how that worked. David went through a good portion of his life being anointed king and having, uh, he did not look like a king. He had to go into hiding. He went into hiding several times in his life as king. So there are going to be times when we may have a particular anointing. We may have a particular plan or a certain, certain reality of who God says we are, but it's not going to feel like it. It may not even seem like it to others. And yet God is pruning and, and refining our lives so that we may do the work that he has for us to do and more importantly, be who he calls us to be with him in his presence. I hope that that brings us hope and joy. But for many of us, it, it, it's like, okay. Let's do this. Because <laughs> it is. It's, it, it's a, a settling in for the journey. It's an exciting journey. No doubt. But there are going to be times in our lives where the reality of what our circumstances show do not match up with the reality of what God says is happening. It comes down to this, though. We must reach a point where we can say to God, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Is there anything that you want in life that could possibly be better or worth switching in your life that it would take the place of the way everlasting? Continue to wrestle with that. What would you even possibly want to switch? I mean, I don't, we don't need answers today. What would you want to possibly switch in your life? What would you possibly want to substitute? You've seen the commercials for the, um, the people that want to buy your annuity and give you just a lump sum. Have you ever seen those commercials? They want to short, essentially short circuit your funds and give you a, a significantly small portion of what those funds are. That way that they can take over the annuity or the investment or whatever the case would be. It's because it's a great deal for them. It's a terrible deal for you. But that's essentially what this would be. That anything in our lives that we would substitute in, that we would take in place of the way everlasting is going to steal life and joy in presence with Christ from our lives. That's what it do. Let's look at Romans 8, just for a second. Romans 8, picking up verse 12. Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if we live according to the sinful nature, you will die. 
But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, excuse me, in order that we also may share in his glory. We are sons and daughters of God. That's who we are. You can count on that. And as we seek to be his children, to do what he does, to, to be with him and be his family, may we seek to live and to love him well. And in doing so, may we also seek to live and love in his name, that others may come to know him as well. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that you made us your family. We understand there's nothing we could do to, to earn it. That you did it. That you brought us life. Lord, we pray that you help us to live well. Help us to grow in our trust. Submit in our fears and surrender in our battles. That we may bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go forth to love and serve the Lord. I would, I would throw out there just to stop fighting him and live with him well. Have a great week. <laughs>